Okay, so you've heard all of the hype around sourdough, the health benefits, the wonderful taste, and the fact that you don't need commercial yeast. But when you tried it out, it didn't come out like the pictures or the videos that you had seen. Maybe you couldn't get your sourdough starter to bubble up nicely, or when you went to bake bread, it fell flat. Today, I'm going to be covering the 10 most common mistakes that people make both when they're creating a sourdough starter and when they're baking sourdough bread. My hope is that this video will help you troubleshoot and have success with sourdough in the future. After I'm done going over these 10 mistakes, I'm also going to be sharing my simple recipe for creating perfect flavored sourdough bread, and I'm going to be showing you a cheddar jalapeno loaf, but you'll be able to use whatever flavorings your family enjoys. I've shared here in the past on how to make sourdough sandwich bread, and I'll link that video in the description, but this is going to be a more traditional boule loaf. If you're new here, I'm Stacy, homeschooling and homesteading mama of seven on a mission to ditch the grocery store and become more self-sufficient. Subscribe to our channel to learn more about our journey and how we are making that dream come true. Okay, let's get started with mistake number one, which is using chlorinated water. This is especially an issue if you live in the city. As a side note, well water can also be an issue if it is contaminated with things like herbicides or pesticides. So if all else fails, you may wanna try bottled water to see if contaminated water is the issue. But for most people, avoiding chlorinated water is good enough. And the reason this is a problem is that the chlorination or other contaminants kill off the good bacteria that you're trying to grow. Sourdough is a living food, so anything that kills bacteria is going to cause it to fail. The good news is that all you need to do is set out your chlorinated water on the counter overnight and that chlorine will dissipate and you'll be ready to bake by morning. This brings me to mistake number two, which is not using organic flour. Now, if you are using conventional flour and it's working for you, well, you probably aren't watching this video, but in all seriousness, I'm not here to say that anything but organic is going to fail, just that if you are having problems, it could be your flour. The reason is that conventional flour may contain pesticide or herbicide residue that will also kill off that good bacteria. Many times I've seen how switching to organic flour has been the missing piece of the puzzle to getting someone's sourdough starter to bubble and thrive. Mistake number three is keeping your sourdough starter at the wrong temperature. When someone tells me that they've seen a few bubbles in their sourdough, but that it just won't double, putting their starter in a warmer location is the first thing I have them try. An easy way to do this, even if it's just temporarily to see if this is the problem, is to place your starter in the oven with just the light on. If this works and you see a ton of bubbles in a few hours of being in that warmer location, you'll know that temperature was the problem. Mistake number four is not giving your sourdough starter enough air circulation. Your starter should be covered to keep out bugs and keep it from drying out, but if you put a lid on it without enough air circulation, you will grow mold instead of healthy bacteria. Mistake number five is not feeding your sourdough starter enough. Your starter is a living thing that needs fed. I feed mine twice a day. The temperature that your starter is kept at will affect how fast your starter ferments or breaks down its feeding and needs to be fed again. So if you don't wanna feed it twice a day, pop it in the fridge to slow down the process. If, however, your starter is in a hot location, you may have to feed it several times a day to keep it from becoming hungry, and you'll know it's starving when it develops a layer of darker, sometimes almost gray liquid on the top, which is called hooch. It is totally fine at that point to drain off that liquid and feed it and nurture it back to health, but know that however often you were feeding it was clearly not enough. Mistake number six is treating sourdough bread like yeasted bread, where you let it rise, you punch it down and shape it, you let it rise a second time, and you put it in the oven. Instead, there are some additional steps that are needed in order for your bread to turn out well. Make sure you are following a bread recipe specific to sourdough, and that you're doing all of the stretch and folds and rest periods that it calls for. Mistake number seven is letting your bread proof or ferment for the wrong length of time. And in my experience, it's usually people overproofing their bread that is the issue more than anything because people assume it's going to take 12 hours for their bread to be ready to bake and then they miss that perfect point. Also, if your house is warmer or colder than the person who wrote the recipe, your timing is going to be different. Instead, learn to recognize the signs that the bread has risen enough without overproofing. And I'd love to say that there is a perfect equation for figuring this out, but really it comes with experience. As a guideline, just know that from the start of the process of making the dough to the final rise, you're looking for it to double in size. Anything past that and you've gone too far. To explain why this is a problem, just know that the dough only has so much rise potential. If it gets into the oven with no potential growth left, it's going to fall flat instead, which is going to give you a dense and hard loaf. Mistake number eight is not creating surface tension when you're shaping your dough. Surface tension helps to create a nice crumb, removes large air pockets, and ensures that the loaf has good structure while baking. 
Mistake number nine is not baking at the right temperature. You must bake sourdough bread at a high temperature to make maximum use out of that rise time so that it bakes before it falls, basically. So if you bake it at too low of a temperature, you'll get a sunken loaf that is more dense. Steam can also help, although I only really worry about this when I'm making a pretty boule loaf. I don't add any steam when I'm making my sourdough sandwich bread, but you can. Steam just gives the dough a little bit more pliability so that it can expand more and allow the loaf to rise to its full potential. Mistake number 10 is the last one and also the one that I make more often than not, and that is cutting into your sourdough bread before it is finished cooling. This one is hard because who doesn't want warm bread and butter, and it's always so exciting to see how it turned out. But when you cut into warm bread, then you let the steam escape, which is still cooking that bread. If you let out that moisture, it will sink, and the remaining moisture will just set, and you'll end up with soggy, dense bread. If you let it cool fully, it will finish cooking, and the texture will be so much better. Okay, hopefully you found that helpful and maybe helped troubleshoot what was going wrong with your own experience. Now let's go make some bread. Step one is to make sure you have active sourdough starter. It should be bubbly and have almost doubled in size from its unfed state. Then using a large bowl and a kitchen scale, measure out 250 grams of sourdough starter to the bowl. Add in 735 grams of water and then whisk until the starter is mixed well with the water. Now add in 1000 grams of all purpose flour and mix well. I'm using a dough whisk at first and then just my hands to knead it together. Cover the bowl and let it sit for 30 minutes. Next, sprinkle 15 grams of salt across the top of the dough and then 50 additional grams of water. Just using your hand, knead it in well for about five minutes or until the salt and water are fully incorporated. Now, if you choose to do so, you can add in the flavorings. I'm adding in candied jalapenos, also known as cowboy candy, and some cheddar cheese. I do not have exact amounts here. Instead, I want to encourage you to get creative with what you add and how much you add, kneading it in until it looks just how you want it. You can add in cinnamon and raisins or just cheese or whatever your family likes. Just make sure to knead it in well so that the added ingredients are evenly distributed. Cover the dough again and let it rest for another 30 minutes. For the next two hours, do a series of stretch and folds approximately every 30 minutes. Now I'm giving you exact numbers here, but honestly, I just do it as I'm thinking about it in between homeschooling the kiddos. So don't stress if you aren't able to stick to the schedule. Next, cover it again and let it sit at room temperature until it has doubled in size. You can pop it into the oven just with the light on to speed up the process, but be careful. I've forgotten and turned on my oven with the bread proofing in there more times than I should admit. If it's in the evening and you don't have time to finish it, go ahead and place it in the fridge overnight. Just make sure it's covered. After it has doubled, dump it onto a clean surface and cut it in half. If it's too sticky, add a little flour and knead it in until it can be worked with. If you had it in the fridge, let it sit at room temperature for 30 minutes before doing the next step. Next, spread out each of the halves into large rectangles. Fold in the sides and then roll it up. You're going to now make a ball, pushing and pulling across your counter to build tension in the dough. Learning this step takes a little practice, so don't stress about doing it perfectly. Just know that the goal is to build surface tension in the loaf. Now leave the shaped loaves on the counter for about 20 minutes. After this time is up, shape the dough in the same way once more. Next, scoop up your dough balls and place them in proofing baskets or in bowls that have a light coating of olive oil on it, which is what I do. Cover them and let sit for one more hour. Some people refrigerate them at this point, but I rarely have room in my fridge for this. But if your house is warm, this is probably the best way to prep the bread for baking. Towards the end of that hour, preheat your oven to 450 degrees Fahrenheit with your cast iron Dutch oven in it. Now, if you don't have a Dutch oven, it's okay. I've successfully baked sourdough bread just on a baking sheet or on a pizza stone, so don't feel like you can't do this without one. Now, move the loaves to two sheets of parchment paper. Next, score the top of the bread. If you wanna create fancy designs, which I'm not very good at, you can rub a little flour on the top first to make them more pronounced. Another little tip is to create your small slashes first and then your last larger slash right before you put it in the oven. After your cast iron Dutch oven is preheated, remove it from the oven, transfer one of the loaves with the parchment paper to it, pour a little water down the side under the paper to create steam, return the lid, and place it in the oven. Bake for 25 minutes with the lid on. Then remove the lid and bake for an additional five to 10 minutes or until the top is golden brown. Remove the bread to a cooling rack and then you can repeat the process with the other loaf. 
and make sure to let it cool for at least 30 minutes before diving in. Now you have two beautiful flavored sourdough loaves. Go enjoy and I'll see you here next week.